Cause I was caught in the rags of my sin Wretched and poor, lost and lonely within But the wondrous compassion, the King of all kings In pity and love took me under his wing child of the King, His royal blood now flows through my veins, and I who was wretched and poor now can say, praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. With a heavenly home My Holy Father has made me His own And I'm cleansed by His blood And I'm clothed in His love And someday I'll sing with the angels above Oh yes Oh yes, I'm a child of the King. His royal blood Lord, flows in my veins, and I, who was wretched and poor, now can sing. Praise God, praise God, I'm a child of the King. I'm a child of the King.
John chapter 6 is where we're going to be. You know, there's a, a story of a, a little boy that was cold. It was the holiday season. He was about six or seven. He was standing outside in front of a score, looking inside the window. He didn't have no shoes, and his clothes were all in rags. Well, a young lady walked up and saw him, and she just grabbed him by the arm took him inside and brought him a pair of shoes and, and a complete set of warm clothes. They came back outside in the street and the woman said to the little boy, she said, now you just go home and have a very happy holiday. He said to her, are you God, ma'am? And she said, no, I'm not. I'm just one of his children. Just one of his children. And the little boy said, I knew you had to have some relation. <laughs> The lady saw the need and she met it. The little boy thought it was one of God's children. What a blessing to be thought of as one of God's children. We look at needs, so our problem is we don't always see the need. And then when we do, we just don't think there's much we can do about it. It's too big. And I would venture to say to you, and I suggest to you, that's exactly where God wants us. Is looking at a need that's too big for us to meet. It's exactly where it wants. Because that's where we learn how He has the power to do things that we can't do. And we're going to see that in our scripture today. In John chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed Him because they saw His signs which He performed on those who were deceased. Disease, excuse me. And Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down and numbered about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. And the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments of five bar barley loaves which were left from those who had eaten. And those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, God, you just anoint me this morning that I might share what you have for each and every one of us. Let me hear your spirit speak and to respond to him and none of the Lord. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the hope we have in him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Walking with Jesus, we will see needs. But often we'll seek to meet those needs in the flesh. Jesus will use us, but we must follow his leadership. 
to experience His power. It's that simple. Now just look at these disciples. They were walking with Jesus. He, and they knew that He drew people to Him. Everywhere He went, people came. And everywhere that they came, He met their needs. Here in this scene, they just crossed the Sea of Galilee with Jesus. And they sat down with Him. In verse 3. It was one of his methods of teaching and discipling to sit and to teach. And we do that on Wednesday night and Sunday morning for Sunday school. We just sit and talk and, and communicate with one another. And there's, there's a, an intimacy about that. It was a time for them to ask questions, to grow in their intimacy with Jesus. Uh, that's something they really couldn't do or didn't have when all the crowds were there, just too many people. Well, as they walk with Jesus, almost always, others would soon come. And that's what happened here in these verses. In verse 5a, when he looked up and saw a large coming crowd coming toward him. It's clearly, we can see there was a lot of people who came. And Jesus ministered. He ministered everywhere he went. Every, every time there was a need, he, he met that need. And he had just recently healed a nobleman's son and the man in the pool. And I'm sure you would agree that these are life-changing experiences. The disciples witnessed these, these great things, these miracles. In fact, these miracles were part of the teaching and mentoring, and I would suggest they understood that people would flock to him and that he would teach them. Jesus made sure that Philip and the others understood the need and the responsibility they had to minister to that need. <clears throat> he asked Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Remember, that's what's said in the scriptures. Where are we going to buy food? food? He already knew. Verse 6 says he asked not because he didn't know the answer. He already knew. And he knew what he was going to do. What I would suggest to you, he was trying to help the disciples see the need and how overwhelming it was that they in fact could not meet it. They didn't have what was necessary. I mean, the Bible says there were 5,000 men. That is counting the women and children. So you got, you, you put, let's just say one man, one woman, one child, you got 15,000 people. And the Bible says that all they had was uh, 200 denarii. One denarii or a penny is a day's wage. So they had 200 day, 200 days of wages to feed 15,000 people. Not only that, but just think about this, in the, in the area they lived in, what city had a bakery that could cook that much bread that quick? <laughs> not, not just the fact that what money they had wasn't enough, even if they had enough, how could they get enough bread cooked for 15,000 people? I mean, there's a lot of aspects about this that you look at and say it's impossible. And Philip says what they have isn't enough. That all would even get to eat a little. or some. And Luke, the disciples, suggested in the same uh, situation that he send them away. He doesn't just think about that. We can't do anything, so send them away. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, I can't help but share something. I shared the Sunday school this morning when I was coming in uh, off of the freeway there on the Page Avenue. There was a lady in the ditch over where I turned off. And I just kept going. I said, I can't do that. I ain't got time. I can get to church. <laughs> the Lord said, why? Yeah, it wouldn't hurt you. Just go ahead and stop. See what you could maybe do. I mean, you know, there is the thing about an ox in a ditch. If you're late, that's okay. And I got part way down the road and I said, oh, I better turn, I'll go back. So I did. And I turned around, I pulled up, turned my flashers on, got out, and she was trying to get her to fall. I said, do you have a cell phone? I said, you ain't going to get out of here without a tow truck. Well, I do, but the battery's dead. So I'm going to wait till it charged. I said, well, I got a phone. Which is just <laughs> and she called some guy, somebody and told them where she was at and said, call the tow company and come and get me out of here. And call so-and-so, I don't remember who the lady's name, and tell her I'm not going to be at church on time. 
And I said, well, you okay now? She said, yeah, I'll, I'll be fine. Her car was running, so she won't go and get cold. And uh, she said, well, thank you for stopping. I said, well, I didn't want to stop. I wasn't going to stop. I thought somebody else would take care of it. I don't need to worry about it. i got things to do. But the Lord told me to come back. So if you want to give anybody the credit for it, you give it to Him, not me. And that's why I came back here. Because I didn't, I looked at the situation and I can't get her out of there. What's the point of staying? What's the point of stopping? There's no way I'm going to get, I'm not going to be able to even push her part away. You ain't going to get her out of there. But the point was to give what I had. What I had was a tough one. Amen? God don't know what God did with it and how he worked with it. And, and lo and behold, it wasn't that far just about the time I was leaving. Uh, I don't know what to call. Maybe you all know who they are. There's a community help aid. Some of the guy was in a van or a truck of some kind. They had a uniform on. He wasn't a cop, I don't think. But he stopped and said, does she need help? I said, oh, I think she's got it. So somebody else would have come. But God wanted me to go. And I don't know what he did with it. I have no idea how it helped her. But I do know she had a phone. And she could come for help. So, you know, Philip is like most of us. We look at the, the resources, and, and he realized that the only the task, he just looked at it and said, there's nothing we can do. There's just nothing. But the truth is, that's exactly what Jesus wanted him to see. That's exactly what he wanted all the disciples to see. You can't do it. It's too big. You can't, you can't meet the need. And then Jesus says to him, verse 10, make the people sit down. The Bible says there was lots of grass, so I'm sure it wasn't much of an argument with anybody. Say, so, hey, have a seat. Nice and comfortable on the grass. Make the people sit down. <clears throat> the Bible says, then the great multitude that followed him sat down on the grass. Now, most of them were probably tired. Most of them probably hungry. Most of them probably willing to do just about anything anybody told them to, to get their needs met and taken care of. So they did. And I can almost see these disciples saying, you know, you know, Lord, these folks aren't going to eat. That's their problem. They're dumb enough to follow you out here in the middle of the wilderness, and they're dumb. They just don't deserve anything else. This is what they ought to have. In Luke 9.12 it says, Late in the afternoon the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can, they can go to surrounding villages and court countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. As I said earlier, they didn't even want to do nothing. Send them away. Let somebody else take care of their problem. Let them take care of their own problem. But Jesus said, No. Absolutely. And somebody says to him, Well, we got five fish and two the five bread, loaves of bread, and two fish. And one of the other disciples said, that ain't even enough. That won't do anybody any good either. What does Jesus say? <clears throat> Bring it to me. And they did. And he blessed it. And then he said, pass it out. Well, I don't know how he did this. I, I, I don't know how he took five loaves of bread and two fish and passed it out to almost 15,000 people. The Bible says they had so much left. After they ate, there were 12 baskets. I have no idea how he did that. All I know is what the disciples did. What he told them to do. They listened to him. Even in the, in the, the face of this this need that was just overpowering. That there was no way physically they could meet it. They just did what he told them to do. They just did it. I think it's a beautiful picture for you and I in, in our life today. You know, there's, there was this guy that I used to talk to. That he hunted frogs. <clears throat> and and he, he was out one day trying to catch some. He just couldn't catch any of them. So, and then he, he did some investigating and he found out something about frog visual powers that he didn't know. I didn't know this either that what they do, what their eye does is it, 
the optical field of perception is like a blackboard. It wipes clean. And the only thing you can see are predators that might hurt them and food that they can eat. They don't see nothing else. And that's why you can't catch them sometimes. <laughs> okay. they're, they're not being caught up with the things alongside of them, you know? Their, their, their restricted eyesight gives them a great ability to keep from getting picked off by people like me and you. Now think about that. If you and I had that kind of eyesight, the reality is it would be a handicap. But there is a spiritual lesson for us here. The Christian life, we frequently become preoccupied with the things of the flesh. We don't allow ourselves to just focus on the things that Jesus is doing. He's doing and working. He said, my father's at work. Always. And I'm working with him. So that means no matter where we are or what we're doing, God is working. And if we don't see it, it's because we've allowed the world to cloud it out. We're not seeing what he's doing. <clears throat> As a child of God, we should be able to see it. How did these disciples see it? Well, I think the example, therefore, is this fellowship with Jesus. That's the key to seeing what he sees. That's the key to learning how to listen and trust his direction. That's the key to living in a victorious life. It's intimacy and time with him. We can know what he's doing. We can share what he's doing by spending time with him. It's important to see where Jesus was working because if we don't, we become overwhelmed by what we see all around us. Disciples had this intimate time with him. We read the New Testament, you'll see it again and again where he sat down with them. And we can have that same thing. The time of Bible study, of sitting down with the Word of God and reading what God gives us. Of turning that television off and not letting it take us away from what we read. And I don't mean to sit there and say, well, I've got to read 16 chapters today. I mean, you might not read but four verses. But listen to what it says. Get into what it says and allow the Holy Spirit to work. Because He will. Not this superficial reading, but a time of seeking His presence. You know, I, I, we, we wrestle with this thing. Is God who He is? Is God supernatural? Yes, He is. Does the Holy Spirit live in the lives and the hearts and the spirits of children of God? Yes, He does. And if He does, then He's talking to us. And that time alone with the Bible is a time to ask questions. It's a time to listen through His Word and through the Holy Spirit. It's a time that so often we miss because we allow the things around us to distract us. Okay, here's a great example, I think, of an illustration. We celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas time. But have you ever really, really thought about what happened when the Holy Spirit came upon Mary? Think about this. The, the Spirit, we understand that word to mean wind. That's what it, that's what it means. Okay? Uh, somehow, he physically planted the seed of Jesus in Mary's womb. I don't know how he did that, but he did that. Okay? Physically, put that seed there, and physically, a baby was born, and physically, conceived, and physically, it was born. Jesus was a person. He wasn't a spirit or a figment of somebody's imagination. The Spirit of God did that. What I want us to grasp is the Holy Spirit is not some unseen force that we imagine. He works in our lives. He opens doors. He closes doors. He allows us to read the Word of God and, and, be, and have the revelation of the truth of what's there. He opens our spirits to hear. But we've got to read it. We've got to spend time in it looking for what God has for it. But we are so much like the disciples. We allow the power of the flesh to work in our lives. Do we have the resources? Do we have the money? Do we have the folks, the gifts of doing what needs to be done? We look at the world around us 
and we think, what can we do? Have you ever thought about the fact that right now same-sex marriage is being accepted by many, even in churches? I, I just read the other day about some guy that used to be a pastor in, in Grand Rapids who's talked about how the church is going to have to come to a place where it recognizes that this is okay because that's where our culture is going. And we look at that and we see our government moving every single day closer and closer to making it legal. And we say to ourselves, what can I do? Abortion is accepted by means as a, many as a means of birth control. I just posted something the other day that the number of children that have been killed by birth control is overwhelming. Folks take, folks take the principles of the Bible and they distort them and make them self-serving. I don't know about you, but I've seen it ever. I see it all the time. And I see it in pastors, quote unquote. They like to call themselves pastors. <coughs> Taking the word of God and saying, well, you know, these two verses here that talk about this, we really don't need to pay much attention to them. That was for that culture. And I like to ask the question, if you have a right to take these two verses and tell me that they're not meaningful today, then I have a right to take two over here and say, oh, these aren't meaningful. Because who are you to define to me what the Word of God is, truth or not? And you see, that's the danger when, when men who, quote unquote, are supposed to be great theological experts start telling us that we don't need to pay any attention to certain verses who chooses which verses? Uh, who are they to tell us we don't need to pay any attention to that? There's the danger of it all. Either God's word is God's word, and God's word is something we need to trust and believe, or it's not. And the audacity, they didn't get me on my high horse, the audacity of this culture we live in today to think that we are so much smarter and more uh, compassionate than any other nation that we can tolerate homosexuality and killing babies. To think that we are so enlightened and never stop and realize that it's happened before. There have been other, other cultures that have been down the same road that we're on and where are they today? They don't exist. They're gone. Because they chose to ignore the authority of the Word of God. And I would suggest to you that's where this country's headed. Now you're going to get me off on another <coughs> tangent, and I don't want to do that. But I do believe this country's under judgment. I believe it with all of my heart. The only reason that I can explain why people believe the lies they hear from politicians is because God lets them. And I don't care what party it is. We look at that, we look at this, this culture we live in, and how easy is it for you and I to say, I can't do nothing. It's too big a problem for me. I can't change this world. Maybe. Just maybe what God's doing with the Christian community is the same thing he did with these disciples. He's saying to us, look at the problem and understand you can't fix it. But I can. You just obey. Just take those five loaves. Take those two fishes and feed them to people. In other words, what he's saying is take what you have to our world, Amen. to your neighborhoods, to your families, to the people you touch. Tell them the truth of what you know to be the truth of God's Word and how God's worked in your life. You, you know, folks say, you know, I don't know how to be a witness. Well, what is a witness? You should define what a witness is. What is a witness? It's somebody who experienced or saw something, right? Now, if you're here today and Jesus is your Savior, you experienced something with God. You experienced His forgiveness. You experienced however He reached into your soul and your spirit and let you know that yes, you are a born-again child of God and nobody can take that away from you. Amen. And all you need to do is witness to that truth. 
How can they call you a liar? They haven't been in your heart. They haven't been in your spirit. They don't know what God's done, but you do. Amen. And so being a witness isn't a matter of being a theologian. It's just a matter of telling, this is what God did for me. This is how he changed my life. And I'm not everything I ought to be, but praise God, I'm not what it was. I have hope. You see, that's where I think he wants us to be. And if we just look at him and trust him with what he's got. These, these disciples fed 15,000 people with five loaves and two fish and walked away with 12 baskets of food. What's he going to do with you and me? In a culture we live in, we think there isn't any hope. What's he asking you to do? He's asking you to just give what you can. To give what he's given you. Your money, your time, whatever it is. Give it to his work. Does he want all of it? I don't know. You might be like the rich young ruler and he might be saying, go and sell everything and follow me. I don't know. That's between you and him. But whatever he asks of you, we need to rest in the assurance that if we seek his leadership, we spend time alone with him, we have this intimacy with him, we're going to find the answer. Somebody said, you know, sometimes you take a journey, you just go as far as you can, and then you look and you see how much further you can go. You don't worry about what's way out there, because there's nothing you can do about it. A man, there was a man who works in the field of chemistry that pointed out that if you mix hydrogen and oxygen, the two well-known components of water, you get no reaction. No water. But if you add a small amount of platinum to the stable mixture, things begin to happen very rapidly. The hydrogen and oxygen unite, the chemical changes occur, and it produces H2O. What a beautiful, beautiful illustration. Just as platinum is needed as a catalyst to achieve the desired result, so faith must be present in our walk with the Lord if we're to experience all that He's going to do. We just have to trust Him. You say, well, I, I try to be everything God wants me to be. I work hard at it. Let me give you another illustration I heard recently that I think is just awesome. Have you ever tried to dilate your eyes? Physically say to your eyes, okay, shrink up. Can't do it. You have to get out in the sun for your eyes to dilate. That's the only way it's going to work. How do you become obedient and holy before God? You can't make yourself do it. You have to get with the sun. And it happens. The sun being Jesus Christ. He's our power. And whatever way you can discover to have that intimacy with him, take it. Trusting that he's going to do things in your life you never thought or imagined could possibly be done. You're going to feed 15,000 with five loaves. I don't know how. I don't know how he did this. I don't know how the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in Mary's womb. But I know he did it. There's no question about it. So how's he going to do it with you and me? I don't know how. But I know if I draw closer and closer to him, and if you draw closer and closer to him, it's going to happen. We're going to change our world in His power. And the wonder and beauty of it is, you and I are going to get together up the to toilet baskets. <laughs> Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for what you've given us here today. Thank you for Jesus and the hope that we have in Him. What a matchless, powerful God we serve. The way that He does things 
The way he puts us in a place where we can't see how to possibly fix things is just awesome. Because then we know there's no way to there's no way to get it fixed but in the power and blood of Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our everything. And we need to spend time with you. To walk, to talk, to read your Bible, to, to come to worship, to pray, and to listen to the guidance of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, for what you've given us. I thank you for Jesus and all that he means to us and the hope we have in him. I ask now, God, you bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing the first verse of number 138, Come and Die. 138. <laughs> That you just listen to the Holy Spirit right now. Your child of God, He loves you and He's speaking to you and He's guiding you to do, if nothing more, than to make a commitment to spend more time with Him. If you hear Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, no question in my mind that the Holy Spirit is saying to you, come. Come. Receive Jesus today. Confess your sins. Confess that you are a sinner. Believe that Jesus died to pay the debt for your sin and say to him, Father, I ask you to forgive me. And I receive Jesus now, right now, as my Lord and Savior. Do that, and your eternity is sealed forever. Amen. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for what you've given us. Thank you, Father, that you've given us an opportunity today to fellowship in our chili cook-off after church. I pray, God, you'll bless the food, bless the fellowship, bless all of those who are here today with the power and presence of your Spirit. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody shake hands for somebody. God bless you.